Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Daily Recap. This is day two of ACR 2023. I'm Jack Cush with Room Now. Uh, in these Daily Recaps, I asked the Room Now faculty to join me in an end of the day discussion of what we thought was kind of neat, cool, or maybe a game changer uh, from today's many, many presentations. Uh, our faculty uh, today uh, is Catherine Dow from Dallas, uh, Mike Putman from Wisconsin, and Eric Dine from New Jersey. How are all of you? Awesome. Good. Thanks, Jack. All, all right. right. Thanks for asking. Glad, glad everyone's here. The, the rules are we're just going to go around the horn and hear what, what uh, sort of uh, was the, the highlight of the day. Uh, we'll do two rounds. And uh, why don't we begin with uh, Dr. Putman? Yeah, thanks for thanks for including me. Now, my highlight of the day is actually one that shifted right at the end here. I am very interested in adverse events from our medications, and I have been particularly annoyed by the persistence of the malignancies and TNF inhibitors question. And there were a couple abstracts today that tackled this. One, one interesting one in the afternoon session, uh, it was looking at uh, TNF inhibitors in patients with rheumatoid arthritis and cancer. So the abstract number 1678, um, the author was Xavier Zendadego. And what they did is they looked at a large database and they identified patients with rheumatoid arthritis who received either TNF inhibitors non-TNF biologics, like rituximab, abatoceptoslizumab, or JAK inhibitors. And they did all the fancy statistics to find out whether one of these was associated with the development of incident malignancy. Now, at first glance, I really liked this study because the TNF inhibitors did very well. As expected, the JAKs had a small increased risk of malignancy, a hazard ratio of 1.3, which roughly replicates what we saw in oral surveillance. But then I got thinking about the patients who got abatacept and rituximab and IL-6 inhibitors first line instead of rheumatoid arthritis. And I, I just think that patients who get the, those are a little bit different from the patient who starts off only getting a TNF inhibitor. So there's probably some channeling bias where sicker patients or patients who have specific risk factors are winding up in that group. And so I kind of started to be a little bit skeptical of it. And then I went and looked at the Kaplan-Meier curve. And this is my quick evidence-based medicine teaching point of the day. When you see a Kaplan-Meier curve, those are those pretty little lines and they diverge. And if they diverge, that's a sign that there's a big difference. Ask yourself when they start to diverge, is that reasonable? And in this study, they started to diverge around day 20 or 30. And it just isn't plausible to me that any of our biologics is going to cause a new cancer within 30 to 60 days. It doesn't seem like it's the kind of thing that I would expect. And so my take home point is that I think TNF st inhibitors still do not cause cancer. But even when you're assessing data where the conclusion reinforces your priors and is kind of what you were hoping to see in the first place, you need to question it even stronger. And in this case, I think there's some clear signs of bias, which the presenter did a very nice job of highlighting. Yeah, there were a number of good cancer um, uh, abstracts here. And good is, I'll just, that's being complimentary. They they all are flawed in many ways um, in, as to how they're done and, and whatnot. But um, these, this is kind of, the research is really hard to look at, Mike. I mean, it, because it, it kind of feeds on everyone's gravest concern. Um, I mean, and the simple, clearest example of that is, Everyone in the audience gets very antsy, very worried when the patient's got, you know, psoriatic arthritis and they come down with breast cancer. And now there's this great rush to like, oh, my God, I've got to respond to that and not do it. Totally disregarding over 20 years of data that says and ACR guidelines that says if you've got a solid tumor, treat as if they didn't have a solid tumor. Let the cancer doctor treat whatever's going on and you treat the arthritis and that's the way it's going to work. But yet everyone gets wigged out by this. And so when this data comes up and makes claims, um, it, it just gets under everyone's skin. So is there a, um, I, I like the, the common sense rule on how to read Kaplan-Meier curve, but um, <laughs> how, how do you safeguard against idiocy when looking at all these cancer reports? Yeah, I mean, my, my biggest rule is look for a comparator, look for a denominator. So little case reports don't count for anything. You got to have a study where you're looking at a, one group and another, and then you have to have a big denominator because these are rare events. And so you need to have a lot of people. 
But then past that, you really need a strong methodology. The next one I'll talk about in a minute is what I think is the best way to approach questions like this. So I'll save that for later. Okay. Um, Eric and Kat, do you have any comments on my, Mike's uh, presentation? I think you need the numerator, the denominator, and, and you need time. And and when you have, um, you know, as, as you said, it, it's not going to happen overnight. And it's good that we have 20 years of data, but to, to have randomized groups where it's not going to be um, biased by who's in which group it is a challenging thing. And so, but I, it, it's something that persists out there, but I think, you know, we have decades of reassuring data that we should be pointing to. Catherine? I think it still goes back to disease activity. You know, like when patients have higher disease activity, they're more likely to have cancer. And once you control for the disease activity, it actually it levels out. And I think that's also the same, same cohort that they looked at for the um, target trial emulation, right? For ILD and use of TNF inhibitors, JAKs and Oh, 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 I shouldn't, I should not reveal your second abstract. Okay, never mind. Mm, okay, <laughs> let's move on. Let me talk about mine, Jack. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to underscore Catherine's point, And that is everyone forgets that um, bad RA, chronic bad inflammation is a driver for cancer. And the, and, the, and the pattern is the same. And it's, by the way, it's the same pattern that we ascribe to TNF inhibitors and all the drugs that supposedly cause cancer, and they don't. And that is, you know, more non-melanoma skin cancer, more lymphoma, right? Uh, um, more lung cancer, uh, and maybe there's more leukemia, but but basically that's the pattern. So um, look at RA as the culprit more than more than anything. Catherine, what's your um, highlight of today? I love plenary sessions because those are the sessions that change my practice and also change my thinking. And today's plenary section, there's an abstract, 1584. Um, this is an abstract put out by UAB, okay, University of Alabama, Birmingham, uh, Jeff Curtis's study. And what they're looking at is that age old question, you know, should we use PJP prophylaxis, particularly in patients with GPA on rituximab and does prophylaxis with trimethorphan, sulfamethoxazole, not just reduce PJP, but what about other infections like serious infectious events and outpatient infections or non-serious infectious events? So what they did was they looked at 919 patients, um, about a third of them were on prophylaxis, 40% of them were on prednisone, more than 20 milligrams a day, and they were followed for a median of about 500 days. The rate for serious infections actually weren't that bad, um, 6.1 per 100 patient year. So that's kind of comparable to like the TNF inhibitors. For outpatient infections, 28.7 per 100 patient year. And Jack, if you remember, we did a meta-analysis on non-serious infections and non-serious infections with TNF inhibitors is about 20 to 25 uh, per 100 patient year. So this is kind of keeping in line with that too. And then PJP pneumonia, uh, the rate was 0 0.7 per 100 patient years. Now, what's interesting was that, yes, there were 13 cases of PJP and all the cases were related to patients not taking um, prophylaxis with trimethorphan sulfamethoxazole. And they, when they did the statistical analysis, they found that the adjusted hazard ratio is pretty good. It's like 0 0.5 um, for serious infections um, and 0 0.7 for outpatient or non-serious infections. Now you have to balance that with adverse events because the users of prophylaxis, they had 30 per 100 patient year of adverse events compared to just 13 on people who were not on prophylaxis. So it's, it's good to know that PJP prophylaxis prevents not just PJP, but also outpatient infections and serious infections. But, you know, where do you weigh the risk benefits with, you know, side effects of sulfa drugs, rash, nausea, um, Stevens-Johnson syndrome? My take home point is, I think that if patients are on high dose steroids, are on, um, you know, these potent immunosuppressants, I would go ahead and prophylax them. Now, I know you may feel differently, and I know Mike has uh, certain opinions about this as well. Well, I, I want to say that um, I was on a recent panel discussion with 
pulmonologist and an ENT from Harvard. And when asked, do they prophylax their GPA patients? Both of them said no. Um, very little benefit and more hassle than it's worth. I think rheumatologists are kind of varied on their use of this. Let me let me ask Eric, do you uh, prophylax um, a GPA patient? Uh, I certainly do with high dose steroids. And I've been of the practice that when they reach below 20 milligrams that, that I would take it off and I let steroids be the guidance. But I, I recognize that, you know, the UR recommendations from last year was was frank of vasculitis that you should prophylax for all rituximab patients. And, um, you know, I, I think this shows it's a rare event in terms of the PJP. Um, but I still think, you know, the elephant in the room with, with that study is, is the steroids, the disease activity, all those other factors. Um, and, and I think certainly being on the, the Bactrim may prevent some infections, but, you know, we, we have stewardship of antibiotics for a reason that, um, you know, just because you, you can't prevent some infections doesn't mean that it's necessarily the right thing for the patient. I was involved in a, in a fairly big data set analysis of a, a large data database of patients uh, looking at PJP infections, and it was and this was Kevin Winthrop and Atul Diodar and myself and a, few, a bunch of other people. Um, and uh, the the big player in this was they were all on rituximab. I mean, it was just a, it was shocking to me. I, I mean, I knew about some of that, but I wasn't surprised. So anyway, Mike, what, what's your feeling on this? Yeah, I, I really like this topic. I think it's interesting uh, trying to prophylax against rare events. I do think that of all of our diseases, vasculitis is clearly the one with the highest risk. I've done a bunch of papers on this at this point. And uh, the, Inca, the Inca incidence is much, much higher than in lupus or myositis or other vasculitis. So um, I think that this is the cohort to do it. And his study evaluated the first period, which is the time to do it for sure. But kind of an unanswered question is when to stop, as Eric alluded to. I personally stopped at 20 milligrams. I think that once you go below that, the risk goes down. In the study that I just published in ACNR, we actually evaluated patients on rituximab maintenance therapy. It was tough to get those really well ironed out. So I don't, you know, I don't feel super strong about it, but um, there was a very low incidence in people who continued on rituximab in our study at least. And so I think that once you're down to that rituximab maintenance therapy, I tend, I very rarely prophylax those patients. And I think that's very sage. I, I think that, you know, I, other users of rituximab, I don't prophylax RA and lupus and whatnot. But why would I do GPA? One, they're older. Two, they have lung damage, damaged tissue, great place for bugs to seed, grow and become a problem. And um, then all the therapies we use, the high doses of steroids, mycophenolate, and then rituximab is a new risk factor that gets added to the mix. And this is a, these are strong reasons for patients with GPA and probably MPA, I would, I would put in there, maybe even G EGPAs as well. Um, but again, the, this analysis that Catherine presented was, um, was just on GPA. It's um, only on GPA. And not only that, I agree with Mike with regards to induction therapy, because this is when they have so much inflammation. And we know inflammation itself increases the risk for infection too. Yeah, that was a that was a great presentation. All right, um, Dr. Dine. Yeah, uh, so I I always like, you know, we do so much in rheumatology that it's not based on evidence. I, I like that when we take something we do common practice and, and we we try to go back and look at the evidence for it. And so I, I like seeing abstract fifteen eighty three, which was um, the SMART study coming out of India, and this was looking at methotrexate twenty five milligrams, and it was comparing single dose, uh, once a week, methotrexate, 25 milligrams, again, split dose, still once a week, morning and evening, um, 25 milligrams uh, in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, we know that it's more bioavailable to give it um, split dosing. There's been pharmacodynamic studies for that. Um, not as good, of course, as, as doing it subcutaneous, um, but it, it's good to have some data to look at um, at, at how well it performs. Um, you know, I think this is a, a study designed for, for EB room here, but um, it, it's a little interesting the way they did a 24 week randomized study, about 125 patients in each arm, and, and they looked out 24 weeks for, for a ULA response. 16 weeks are on the primary drug, um, either split or, or single dose. And then at 16 weeks, 
they allowed for patients to have a second drug, uh, another CSD mart added on for incomplete disease control. So the primary endpoint was looking at 24 weeks if they had a good response. 29% um, in the split dose, 22 in the in the single dose did not meet the, the endpoint. But it is interesting if you take a look at some more of the data there, at 16 weeks, they did meet their endpoint. And what stood out to me, what I found most interesting was 54% of the patients in the single dose needed a second DMAR, only 35% in the split dose needed it. So definitely um, more patients needing more treatment it, when you take the single versus the split dose. A couple other things that were interesting in the um, in the study is that the, the adverse events were actually pretty similar between the groups and not meeting statistical significance, a little bit of a trend towards transaminitis. I, I think overall, I think it was a little bit of an underpowered study. Um, we, we would certainly expect to, to see more, um, more side effects when we're giving higher doses and more medications. Uh, I, and I think the fact that it didn't reach the primary endpoint is it, certainly disappointing. I think it, it, it shows that patients do require more, more, more drug and an escalation of care when they're on the single, um, but that allowance did then take away from their overall study design. Yeah, Dr. Um, I think his name was Dahir, um, made admitted that they made a mistake in their primary endpoint. Their primary endpoint should have been week, week 16 when they were just on methotrexate, either single or split dose. And there the results were overwhelming, you know, 75% ACR20 versus like 52%, ACR50, ACR70 and DAS remissions were all significantly better at week 16 in the, or, in the split dose oral. And yeah, I was, I was bothered and asked the question about if you're given more drug and split dose, you should have more side effects. And they really didn't, but they did have more transaminitis. I think that just, they may not be good. Those patients are, are maybe different than our patients, and maybe they didn't ask the questions as well as they may ha should have. But nonetheless, I thought it was um, helpful um, and, and a really well done study uh, for what I thought were novices at doing studies. Mike, what do you think of the data? Yeah, this is my one of my rules. Don't do wonky things with RCTs. You know, if you got an RCT, just do an RCT. Every time we try and get cute and fancy, bad things wind up happening. So, I mean, I'm I'm a split dose kind of guy. I always split when I go over about six milligrams uh, weekly. And so, for me, this mostly concerned confirmed my practice. I mean, it's important to me that in those first sixteen weeks, people don't have the kind of side effects and do have the efficacy that we want. And I mean, that's a real time where you can show people that your therapies work, you can demonstrate competence. And so I think that splitting is definitely something I'm going to keep doing based on this data. You mean six it, tabs weekly, right? You didn't mean six milligrams weekly. Six tabs. Apologies. Okay. Yes. <laughs> but yes. Once I get to six tabs, I split. Yeah. One, so, one of the things that was really provocative to me was the fact that, you know, like, what percentage of your patients are actually on 25 milligrams a week of, of methotrexate? Because right. I don't think I have, but maybe a handful, to be honest with you. And I treat a lot of RA. I'm, I'm well, about 20%. Yeah, about 20%. I would say about 3%. Three, me. wow. Is yeah, that because you're giving people DMARDs on top of it and you back off? I no, have I just, <laughs> Yeah, we, we, we have this special handshake in Dallas that um, patients don't need the extra five milligrams of methotrexate. But I, I do think it was by being protocolized, I think there is something smart in this study in that, you know, they started everybody 15 and then the two weeks it went to 20 and two more weeks, everybody's on 25. And there was no talk. Again, there was a problem with side effect reporting in the study, I believe. But nonetheless, I mean, 25 is a good, healthy dose. It's not a dangerous dose by by no means. Um, I think there was something smart in, in, in that particular design. So... Other than the wrong uh, uh, endpoint uh, as far as time, um, I think this was a really well, well done in study and quite instructive. Catherine, did you have any other further comments on it? No, I'm just kind of curious what percentage of Eric's patients are on 25 milligrams a week. I, I would say close, maybe not 20, but but um, definitely definitely closer to 20% than 3%. I, I, I try to bring up the dose, but when I get up there, I... I'm certainly splitting the dose and I'm talking to them about subcutaneous because, you know, if you go from 20 to 25 and you're not splitting the dose, they're not actually seeing that much more because the bioavailability difference is, is, is not that much at that level. 
Right. Yeah, so let me have, actually one. let me actually ask you, uh, uh, Catherine and Jack, how many of your patients are on subcutaneous then? Oh, so uh, subcutaneous, a third of my patients are a third. There it is. So I have I have probably three <laughs> percent. Yeah, I see. I I have very few five, very few now, uh, because really about I don't know eight ten years ago, I I stopped using subcutaneous. I went to split oral. And that's really the big take home message in spite of our great discussion here. The bottom line is once you get to 15, you got to be splitting the dose. And the way that they split it was we could do seven and a half and seven and a half given AM and PM. They made, because they have five milligram tablets, they gave 15 in the morning and 10 at night. Um, and that was their split dose oral. And, and if you're above 15, you got to split the dose just to ensure the absorption and to get what you're trying to get out of that dose of methotrexate. So it starts at 15 and it continues whether you go to 20 or 25. I'm always perplexed by the pediatric rheumatologists who put all their kids on parenteral. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've never understood why you would do that, especially given that some of the split dose oral um, studies that are out there actually have been done in children, showing that the uh, area under the curve is exactly the same as giving or split dose oral to parenteral. Inter yeah. And again, the other interesting thing about this study is there are a lot of studies about split dose oral, but none with efficacy outcomes. And that's what's kind of cool about this particular study. Catherine. Sometimes kids can't take pills. <laughs> so that might be one of the reasons why they use parenteral. I mean, there so, are some kids you have to practice pill taking with them. You know, you know like my and, kids. And, 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 and let's, as opposed to chasing them around the room with a needle, um, that's real popular. Um, My son takes his sub Q uh, uh, immunotherapy for allergies, and he does that pretty well. <laughs> again, this is what the pediatric rheumatologists and I believe them when they say it's really not an issue. I'm surprised, and then I, I I spent many time many hours in pediatric rheumatology clinics, and I always thought it was an issue. But anyway, we'll move on. I mean, you know, I, I one of you took the the main one I was going to do. So let me ask the three of you um, any takeaway comments about the great debate. The great debate was Dr. Robert Spira versus um, who? Phil um, Cio. Oh, Phil Cio, talking about whether or not you should be using steroid sparing, early steroid sparing um, uh, IL-6 therapy in patients with GCA. Um, I assume all of you saw, saw that. Anybody want to comment on who won and what the take home points were? Eric? I love the fact that Harry Spira is is uh, Robert Spira's dad, and he was kind of like the one who described the entity PMR to begin with. I think you know he wins <laughs> just because just because Harry Spira is his dad. By the way, Harry Spira inspired me to go into rheumatology. I knew Harry Spira very well. Um, wow. A wonderful man. Um, uh, but all right, so you think Rob Spira won? Catherine? I think, uh, no, not necessarily. I Let's just say this. It depends on what part of the country you're from and how easy it is to access cerilumab and, and also tocilizumab. Let's just say that. But I do believe Only that- Tocilizumab is approved. If it's approved, readily available, I would like to avoid um, a lot of steroids because there is data that cumulative steroid dose can affect patients negatively through osteoporosis, cardiovascular, um, modifications, um, as well as metabolic issues. So for me, I'd like to try it early um, to, to start my patients on these IL-6 inhibitors early. But Phil also had a point, you know, it may be that there will be other biologics or targeted synthetic molecules that might be better than IL-6 inhibitors. And that's come, and those studies are being done. Eric, what do you think of the debate? Yeah, so I, so I did a, a video for Room Now where I, I, I chatted with Dr. Co afterwards, and, and we discussed it. It was probably a, a little bit of a provocative topic to get people going to, to include PMR in it as well as, as a putting all patients um, uh, on first-line biologic is, is certainly quite a lot of uh, patients there. And, and I, I mean, I think certainly for GCA, the evidence is better and better that, that I think going to a first-line biologic is not unreasonable. I think when we get into PMR, it, it's important to remember that we have these steroid sparing drugs. They work well. And, and you know, as Dr. Seale really showed during his talk 
that that toxicity of prednisone on those low doses for that year, two year, however long it does last, really does add up and, and have effects. So we should be thinking about it earlier and earlier. Should it be first line for everyone? I, I think it's it, it's a good fodder for debate. First line meaning that you give people steroids and then instead of going to methotrexate, you go to an IL-6 inhibitor, correct? For, um, for, for which can it, for, um, I, I think for PMR, I think if they fail steroids. Well, wait, but would... the, the debate was about GCA. It was about both. It's was both. it really? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, it was billed as GCA. Um, Mike, your impression of the debate? Uh, I was in the knowledge bowl, so I wasn't able to participate, unfortunately. Right. I have lots of, I have lots of opinions about the topic, though. I could debate myself if that was a, <laughs> of interest. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm kind of same way. This is my let, let, then let Mike you can react to my um, shoot from the hip impression. Um, rheumatologists, when asked interesting questions, will give you an answer as if it's the boards and they want to get it right, which isn't necessarily what they really do. So when you ask rheumatologists, patient with GCA and you can't wean down the steroids, um, and it's week twelve. Um, will you start um, steroid sparing therapy with an IL-6 inhibitor? And the, and and ninety percent are going to say yes. But the actual marketing data says they're a bunch of liars because they don't do that. They don't make that decision quickly or easily. Um, they delay that decision until there's a gun at their head. Um, and so while the growth of IL-6 inhibitors in GCA has come around. They've been out for a long time, and believe me, it's been incredibly slow. So why do we say we do it, but not do it quite as so much? Yeah, I mean, I've I've been on the tocilizumab upfront for GCA bandwagon for quite some time. I think that um, the amount of steroids that patients with GCA receive otherwise is, is very toxic. And I think that the relapse rate among patients with GCA is quite high and the other uh, ancillary complications are very important. I, I think that PMR is a very, uh, a, a much more difficult question. You know, it, upfront interleukin-6 inhibition for PMR is kind of aggressive in my opinion. I think that there is a, at least a third of patients who do very well on a relatively fast steroid taper. And one of my take homes from the data is that I'm going to start trying to taper people a little more quickly up front if I'm not using another agent. And then if they flare, then I'm going to go towards it. The big question for me that remains is if they flare where? So a lot of my patients, they flare around six milligrams, seven milligrams. And I, I, I don't have a sense yet for my threshold. I'm gonna put you all on the spot, but there's some level of steroid where I'd rather just go back up a milligram than keep going down. Um, certainly people who I've had people who are refractory above 12, all those patients I think should be on an interleukin-6 inhibitor. If you can't get them down, you need to be doing something to get them off. But so question to the group, you know, you have a patient who you've been going one milligram every couple of weeks, and then they say, Hey doc, my symptoms are coming back. Their inflammatory markers bump. How many of you would put them onto an interleukin-6 inhibitor if they were at seven milligrams of steroid, or would you just go back to eight and try again? Catherine, go Dr. ahead. Dow? Yeah, I would go ahead and give them the steroid sparing agent because, okay. you know, contrary to popular belief back then, you know, when when I was in training, it we used to be taught, oh, PMR only lasts for two or three years, but we're finding that it's more of a chronic state. So I've had patients on steroids at five or six or seven milligrams, and we cannot taper them down. And they've been on the same dose for 10, 15, almost 20 years. Now that I'm dating myself, but <laughs> Eric, I agree as well. I think if it's if it's more than five chronically, I, I think you, you really need to think about if if we can verify that this is true PMR and not and not something else that's driving it. I, I think anyone on more than five milligrams needs to have a thought about a steroid reduction strategy. So, I'm from New York, and I go to Texas to do my training and I'm in the room with a surgeon and a patient who won't agree to um, have surgery. And the surgeon says, uh, Mrs. Bates, it's time to pull a handle on that dump truck. And I'm like, what the hell? And that's what this is about. Time to pull a handle, meaning 
what we, what you do when you get into this, they're at seven, you go to six, you fail, you go back to eight. Now we're doing uh, some kind of steroid cha-cha-cha that the patient's going to lose. And, you know, it's time at some point you got to realize you do have to pull the handle on that dump truck. All right. Now we're going to get to lightning round. We're going to begin with Catherine. Let's talk about uh, another session or uh, abstract that you saw that you, uh, but give us the quick on it. Okay, so another plenary, abstract 1579. So the question is, do SGLT2 inhibitors actually make a difference for lupus and lupus nephritis, right? So this is actually a very interesting question. Um, they use an emulated database, US large database, and they pulled out people who have lupus and also are on an SGLT2 inhibitors or a DPP4 inhibitors. So DPP4 inhibitors are just like lowering um, blood sugar, but we know that SGLT2 inhibitors, they can actually modulate uh, risk factors for MACE as well as renal disease outside of the hypoglycemic effects, right? So, so they emulated the study and they found like, um, that patients who are on SGLT2 inhibitors who have lupus and lupus nephritis have less risk for MACE and also less renal progression. So the take home point for me is that if I have a patient who has diabetes and I have the choice between an SGLT2 or a DPP4, I would totally choose the SGLT2. You notice you didn't answer my question about how well did they do at controlling diabetes which causes MACE and renal progression. They did the control it, yeah. The, all this covariates no, are controlled. No, at, ba they, at baseline, they had equal um, uh, hemoglobin A1C. She made no comment about what the diabetes control was as a, during the, the duration of therapy uh, or, or, or with ex exposure to the SGLT2 inhibitor. So... I, I think that that's an incredibly important point that was was overlooked. But, um, you know, I think people get this now, but, and, and this has been reported, this benefit, same benefit been reported in gout. Um, and it's also been reported in osteoarthritis of the knee. Um, and, um, and one other, where was the other one that we just saw? Oh, at ULAR, um, SGLP2, uh, SGLT2 T2 inhibitors, in a Canadian database of, of autoimmune patients showing the same thing with cardiovascular um, um, benefits. So the question is, is this gonna be in all of our patients? I mean, it's one thing to say, yeah, I'm happy to have, if I have to choose between di diabetes therapies, I'll use um, this class of drug, but might these drugs be, end up in our patients even though they don't have diabetes? I mean, just like semaglutide, right? <laughs> They're going to yeah, use quick, weight uh, loss and they don't have diabetes. Mike? Yeah, quick thoughts. You know, the hemoglobin A1C is a great question. I'm actually replicating the studies and the same data in ankyl vasculitis right now. And the problem is we had to um, impute many of the hemoglobin A1C values. So I don't know how much we can actually trust those as, a, as an ongoing thing. So that's probably why it wasn't done. The database is missing a lot of those valuable values at baseline. Uh, okay. Now, um, you know, my biggest question when I see abstracts like this is the same one when it comes to ACE inhibitors for lupus nephritis things of that nature, is just, I don't think rheumatologists like making, prescribing these sort of primary care-ish drugs. And so I wonder if we need to take a step back and uh, maybe take a more holistic view and say that, you know, a lot of things that aren't a, an, an immunotherapy are actually a therapy that we should be taking ownership of. So I'm, I'm curious to hear from, from y'all. Are, are, do you try to take ownership of all those decisions, or would you be sending an email to a primary care doctor to say, hey, you know, an SGL2, SGLT2 inhibitor might be a good idea in this case. Eric? Yeah, I, I'm lucky for my nephritis patients that I, I have very good uh, nephrologists that I that I usually kind of work with them on the, the H inhibitors, ARBs, SGL2, those types of, of things. But when we're talking about diabetes and lupus and, and, um, and we're dealing with the primary care, you know, it, it is something that, you know, it's, some, sometimes hard for me to address that all and, and it is important and, and it's 
hard that you're expecting a lot to fall on the shoulders of the primary care. And I think rheumatology needs to be thinking about each of these things more. Catherine, you're great at communicating with your primary care referrals. I mean, it's kind of hard because, you know, we have so much we have to talk about with patients. I mean, their disease, uh, medication, monitoring, vaccinations, reproductive health, cardiovascular screening, and now to take on diabetes. <laughs> um, I mean, if a, if a patient asked me to, and they have no primary care doctor, I could get them started on it, but I don't necessarily want to follow them long-term because I, I just don't think I have the time. If it was a perfect world, let's say, you know, like I'm in concierge, I'm treating like two or three patients a day. Sure. <laughs> you know, I'm a big proponent of taking ownership of hard decisions and most rheumatologists don't manage this because it's not just that it's a hard decision. It's just that it's not my job and my job's already too hard. And I don't need to do all that crap someone else is supposed to do. Not recognizing that, in fact, the doctor is not going to go to the primary care doctor for that. So uh, in, in my patients, I um, take ownership of, uh, of their weight, their smoking, their A1C, their hypertension, their lipids, and their vaccinations. And like Catherine, I'm not going to manage those long term but i'm going to be writing the first prescription and making the plan and following up on it on my next visit um because if i don't do it um the patient always loses and and yeah it's a it's a burden but it, you know it's a little bit like the quote at the end of my email it's supposed to be hard if it wasn't hard everyone would do it the hard is what makes it great and it's about you being great as a rheumatologist um, Eric, what's your next quick hit? Yeah, so another thing not that I'm admittedly not as good at discussing in, in the office as I'd like to be, um, cervical cancer screening in our young lupus patient. I, I know how often you guys think to address this in, in your young female patient. Um, you know, there's a good study looking at cervical cancer screening. They looked at 65 SLE patients, comparing them to healthy controls and HIV positive controls. Uh, and 45% uh, before I even got into the study were not up to date with their screening. Only one had an HPV vaccination. They found that 29% that um, of lupus patients had high risk HPV, which was actually consistent with the general population, but they were much more likely to have multiple strains of high risk PV and, and abnormal cytology. This was about double uh, the general population and um, in line with the HIV positive. Um, population. Um, the, um, they didn't have too much data in terms of the follow-up of future um, uh, pap smears looking to see was there clearance, uh, but it did show that only one in 10 of the patients on long-term steroids and immunosuppressants were able to clear it. Um, so I, I think it's something that we just need to be addressing more and thinking about more and certainly screening for and vaccinating. So what, what uh, I mean, this is a great um, study and an important observation. Um, what, what's your advice then to other rheumatologists who are unaware of this deficit? You know, I think I generally tell patients that you should do age appropriate screening. And, and I think certainly vaccination and, and screening is the first step. But I, I think knowing that it, it's interesting to see that the, the risk is in line with the HIV positive population and I think it's important to know that this is a serious risk factor that um, we need to be counseling patients on. Mike, what do you think? I think this falls in the a really interesting conversation we're having tonight about the the scope of practice. And I, I have not involved myself in these decisions very often. And, um, you know, the, talking about these STLT2 inhibitors really is getting me thinking about it. And if there's something that's going to have a really substantial benefit for a patient that's in your wheelhouse, maybe we should be more involved. But I have not historically been managing this. <laughs> no. Catherine, are you aware of any information about Gardasil in lupus patients? Yes. This is an area dear to my heart um, because it has to do with reproductive health. So as you know, I'm a reproductive rheumatologist as well, currently involved with um, you know, the registry with Megan Close Madre. And we look at 
you know, patients' reproductive health outcomes, um, particularly patients with lupus and, and on these kind of um, medications that can potentially increase the risk for cervical cancer as well as teratogenicity uh, if they get pregnant. And so I don't know if you know this, but one of my friends is Patricia Dar, okay? And she actually published um, in April about cervical health in lupus. And she looked at uh, two things. One is, can patients do their own cervical cancer screening? So no, I do not have a speculum in my office, nor stirrups. But what these patients would do is they would take the regular pap smear and just do a cervical, uh, you know, like a vaginal swab. So you don't even have to get to the cervix, just this vaginal swab. And they send it. And they found that that actually had pretty good specificity as if they did have abnormal cells. And the sensitivity is okay. It's adequate. It's not as good as if you did a cervical pap. But even so, um, based on her study, she found that patients who were minorities, especially Black patients, their risk for cervical dysplasia, and especially high-grade cervical dysplasia, it's like about the HIV, if not higher, like 65% of her population. And a lot of these women didn't realize unprotected sex can give them STDs as well. So there's a lot of room that we have to talk to these patients about sexual health. All right. This is, this is eye-opening and should, should be something that I think we need maybe some guidelines on and some more discussion to help us do a better job of managing this, especially in our in our the many patients we have are at the right age that they should be getting the screening, if not the vaccination. Mike, you can end it up with uh, your quick hit. Yeah, my quick hit is uh, an abstract that I just loved. It was a plenary session by Brian England. It was number fifteen eighty two, and they looked at the risk of um, uh, death or respiratory hospitalization in association with getting either a TNF inhibitor or a non-TNF inhibitor. So they looked at rituximab, abacacept, and some jacks. And I, I think it's an important question. I have never really thought that TNFs make interstitial lung disease worse. It's always seemed wildly implausible to me. So this is one of the examples of what I would consider a very great, good approach to observational data. They took a VA study. They found 27, 237 people um, that they matched to 237 other people who got either TNFs or non-TNF. And then they followed them forward and said, did they have a respiratory hospitalization or death? And what they saw was that there was no association. And so um, for me, this tells me one thing, which is that the idea that TNF inhibitors make ILD worse is probably not real. And so I kind of have already been on that bandwagon, but I want to flip that around. One of the most common non-TNFs that was used in this study, um, you know, half of the people who didn't initiate a TNF inhibitor initiated rituximab which is a drug that we think of as a, a lung, uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis lung drug um, for good reason. I think we're talking about the good agent in that area. And in this study, TNFs didn't look worse but the rituximab didn't look better either, right? That's the same, same, same thing. And so one of my take homes is that um, I suspect that TNFs actually have some benefit in rheumatoid arthritis ILD. Uh, this, that's not what the study assessed, but I suspect that's the case. And at the end of the day, I just think we should be giving rheumatoid arthritis active drugs to rheumatoid arthritis interstitial lung disease. I suspect that the important thing is controlling the um, underlying immunodysfunction. And so that's my strong bias. And I think that this study reflected that where TNFs didn't do worse and they did about the same as some of the drugs like abatacept and rituximab that we think have activity in RALD. So would you rather have had a non-TNF comparator to the TNF group as another way of doing this would have been TNF versus conventional synthetic DMARDs as a comparator to show the superiority of TNF. This was just showed equivalency, right? So I'm left, I, I have the same takeaways as you, but now I'm wondering if they're good, how good, or are they really good? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I I I also think methotrexate probably has some activity. I know most people don't like to use methotrexate in RILD because of the pneumonitis, but that's quite rare, honestly. 
Um, another really interesting comparator would have been an antifibrotic agent. Um, mm -hmm. I'm very curious to know whether drugs that don't have underlying immune suppression activity in RA independently would be better or worse than a TNF. And my money is that they'd be worse, but we're, we're nowhere near that right now. The, those folks were specifically excluded from this study. So if you'd gotten an antifibrotic agent, you weren't allowed to be a part of it. So I'm hoping that their next work is in that wheelhouse. So Catherine, you tweeted about this. What do you think? Um, I've always felt that it was inflammation that drove the ILD, not that TNF inhibitors made it worse. And I thought it was just so silly that people were avoiding TNF inhibitors in the ILD and feeling that rituximab is so much better or TOSI is so much better or something. Um, I What I would be curious would be to have a comparison of triple DMARD therapy with these biologics, because I think that triple DMARD therapy probably will work as well. There's been also studies looking at triple DMARD therapy versus TNF inhibitors for cardiovascular risk reduction, and the triple therapy performed just the same. You know, we tend to think that biologics would be better, but actually, and, and we have to be conscious about um, third world countries who can't afford these biologics. So these are good options, and we need to do those kind of studies. Eric, what do you think? I, I agree. I, my approach is treat the inflammation where you see it. And, and if, if we see inflammation in the joints, I think the approach is to find the best medicine that you could follow the inflammation in the inflammatory markers in the exam. And um, and certainly the PFDs are part of that. But I, I, I my approach is reach to the, the medicines that we know best. And we see a lot of RAI ILD in terms of the subclinical ILD that we pick up on when we're screening for it. And so it, it's it's a common issue and, and TNFs are, are common medicines. I think the, the fear of that combination, I, I think is a little bit, um, is something we need to have context behind. So I'm struck, or what comes to mind is that the um, quote, you know, I don't know what I don't know. And I think there's a lot of that going on here. And the good news is, there's a big interest in interstitial lung disease, um, in rheumatic diseases, but especially in RA. And this meeting has a lot of uh, reports that are trying to address this in many different ways. And that's the comforting part of this, meaning I think I'm going to get around to knowing more about what to do in these folks. And I think we're just scratching the surface. So I want to thank the faculty for a really great discussion of some very interesting abstracts from today, the day two at ACR 23. I ask the audience to tune in tomorrow for the day three recap. We'll have uh, three or four new faculty who come in and, and do equally as well. Thanks so much, Catherine, Eric, and Mike. Thank you. Thank have you. Have a great Good evening. Good, all, good night, all.